morning and welcome. And I'm going to welcome everybody here right now. As soon as this verse is over. Thank you, Jim, for filling in today. And good morning, Al Rock. Happy Memorial Day weekend to each and every one of you and welcome to you all who are watching live stream right now on Facebook and to those who are watching the recording. Welcome too. You can skip ahead if you're watching the recording to about 20 minutes from now, maybe 25. Um, I'll give you the number to go to uh, in the description um, so if you want to skip the preliminaries here. We're going to uh, have an interesting worship service today. Um, first of all, Patricia says hello from Mobile, Alabama. She's with her best friend down there. And some of their other friends who were able to get together this weekend and um, we talked about uh, doing a trip together but we haven't decided where to go yet so um, I'm, I'm sticking it out here um, I'll take a break when I can um, so this Memorial Day um, weekend uh, service today is going to have a special treat because our board chair Don McCain is going to be sharing with us um, and on, in honor of those who have fought and died for our country and have served in the armed services, she has something she'd like to share. Now she's a member of the American, American Legion, Auxiliary. Legion Auxiliary and has been forever. Her father was in the military and so many members of her family and so she'll be sharing with us briefly in the service momentarily. I want to invite everybody to come on Wednesday nights. More people are coming on Zoom now than on Facebook, but we are doing both at the same time. At 6.30, we have a panel discussion. We have people coming in like Gene Martino, who is a pastor and excellent exegete in his own right, and he'll be with us to share and discussing. And we're going to continue our conversation um, uh, about Gehenna tonight, finishing up with Gehenna. And I hope you will come and uh, join us for that. Any other announcements this morning? Lord, we thank you for this day, for our lives. And we come before you with many burdens. And we know it makes sense and it is good sense for us to lay those at your feet, to place them on your altar, to leave them at the foot of the cross. But we cling to them. And we let them distract us and worry us and take us away from our life in you. Help us this morning to remove distractions, to lay our burdens at your feet, and to listen carefully, because we might have a chance to get to know you better, and that is what we want. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is Holy, Holy, Holy. It's number 64. Let's stand and sing. Let 
Lutherans unite in this historic affirmation of the Christian faith. I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. come forward and share with us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm happy to be here on this fine, sunshiny, wonderful day in our Lord's house. Today I want to talk about something that should be important to all of us at this time of the year. It's a day of remembrance. And today I'm going to talk about the poppy flower, which is one that we do May and November. It's a symbol for our veterans. So I want to remind us of Memorial Day and why we remember. We remember all the veterans who sacrificed and served the country to protect and keep us safe. And for those who return home from the service sacrificing vices they made. Excuse me. The poppy is the symbol flower and it's made by veterans in the hospitals. And it is the official symbol of the American Legion's flower. And on Memorial Day weekend and Veterans Day weekends, we distribute these flowers in their honor. So today, how many have served in the armed forces? You have two. Wonderful. Thank you for your service. How many have family members that have served, are no longer with us, or are still serving today? Wonderful. And we want to remember and thank them for their services and their families too because they sacrifice a lot for us to have what we have. And usually this time of year we have a poppy anchor that's made of 12,000 poppies that we launch off Tybee Island. But this year it's been canceled so we'll be having tomorrow a dedication at the headquarters for that anchor and next year we'll be back to normal and everything. Other states do all of these same things. So let us remember um, it started back in the 1800s around 1865 and there were poems written about the poppy and we have someone that was a citizen and from Georgia. Her name's Miss Moena Michaels. She was from Athens, Georgia. 
and she wrote a poem. She was the one that after World War I, as well as through World War II, till she could no longer do it, she started the Poppy Anchor and the um, distribution and making of these poppies all across Georgia. So today, in her honor, this is her poem that I want to read and to celebrate and remember our military and veterans who have passed on and are no longer with us and to remember those that are still with us today doing all the things they can for us. It is entitled, We Shall Keep the Faith. O oh, you who sleep in Flanders Field, sleep sweet to rise anew. We caught the torch you threw, and holding high, we keep the faith with all who died. We cherish, too, the poppy red that grows on fields where valor led. It seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never dies but lends a luster to the red of the flower that blooms above the dead in Flanders Field. And now the torch and poppy red we wear in honor of our dead. Fear not that ye have died for naught. We'll teach the lessons that ye wrought in Flanders Field. And this was by Mo Moina Michaels. Mm -hmm. Today I brought poppy flowers to... Um, so before you leave, please get one from me so that you can have it this weekend and wear it or take it home and do whatever you like in remembrance. Because I know this is a special day for a lot of us and our families and everything. So um, I thank you for thank you. letting me do this. Awesome. And, um, and thank you all for being here. Y'all have a wonderful weekend. I see the party. And Memorial Day. Yeah. Yes. I see that. Yes. Cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I want my puppy. I got one. <laughs> Let's take a moment and reflect on our uh, prayer list. We have, um, thank you again, Donna. Um, I added the family of Tim Partain, my cousin, uh, who passed away, and his family. And Jim added the family of Rosie Hips. And Patricia gave us an update on Debbie. I don't have anything new on that. And, um, but I put Patricia on here just because she's traveling by herself in that car. Thank you for thinking of her. Would you like to add anybody to the list or give an update or can someone come off? Yes, ma'am. I have a friend who just had a shoulder surgery again and her name is Linda Brock. And she's a part of the Legion family. Linda Brock? Linda Brock, yeah. And she, did, she had what? Shoulder surgery this past week. Okay. Any other changes? Let's pray together. Lord, on this special weekend, um, we in this country, as you know, remember folks who served in the military and fought for peace and uh, gave their lives for peace. And they're in my family, they're in so many people's families, maybe most people's families. And we have uh, a couple of gentlemen who served in this room and we're expressing our gratitude for James and Jim and for many others whom we name in our hearts. 
may the memory of them inspire us. And though war is always troubling and to be avoided when evil is uh, in need of confrontation, Lord, we thank you that there were people who were willing to go and lay it on the line. We thank you for their bravery, for their courage, and for their sacrifice. We pray for Alan Hunt and his family, for Christina Branch. We pray there are people who are grieving, Lord, Amina and um, the family of Scott Hudson. We're praying for Jane Stokes' family. There are folks on here who are sick or who are recovering or who, or who are in treatment like Debbie and Teresa. Bless them, Lord. Bless God in his recovery and his return to some semblance of normalcy in his life. Bless Donna and her care for him. We pray for Donna's friend, Linda, and her, sho so her shoulder surgery. We pray for the families of Tim, Partain, and Rosie Hips, and others. Lord, we thank you for this chance to be with you. We lift up all these folks in love, knowing that your care for them precedes our own. Touch them somehow and let them know that we're with them, that they're not alone. And guide us and direct us in our care for them and in our prayer for them. We pray these things in the name of Jesus who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is Trust and Obey on page 467 in your red United Methodist Hymnal, 467. Let's stand and sing.
won't be passing uh, the plate. Um, we may, may get back to that shortly, but it is right there. Should you want to do it while Jim plays us an offertory piece, um, you can get up and go do that now, or you can do it on your way out. Thank you, Jim. I thought about asking you guys to imagine just in your mind the, the perfect God. And then I got really afraid that maybe some of those ideas wouldn't be so good. If we asked everybody out there to define the perfect God and then we tried to form a committee of some kind to get that together and we get the God we invent, how heavy would you be? It says on the front of your bulletin, and I can show it to the people at home, I guess. It says, um, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Know him better. I just like to ponder that a minute. I mean, that, that, he's praying that the God of our Lord and Jesus Christ may inspire you or give you revelation or give you wisdom so that you may know Jesus better. Moreover, Jesus says in this little quote underneath it, in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then Paul said with all of his heart, I want to know Christ. Now, I'm jealous of Paul. At least Paul had the advantage of meeting him. He didn't meet him during his earthly ministry, but he met the resurrected Lord. They talked. He saw him. That's just not fair. Who wouldn't want that? But all three of these emphasize that eternal life. How many people define eternal life? as knowing Jesus and God the Father who sent him. This is Trinity Sunday, and it's really hard, y'all, to use inclusive language um, about the Trinity, but please know that when I say God the Father or something like that, I, I don't mean any sexist things by it. I just mean that's the traditional language that Jesus used, and there's no, it's really hard to get around that, but I don't mean masculine or feminine by using those terms. I don't, if anything, I think of God as masculine and feminine. If we were all made in God's image, then that image includes a female one, right? So I'm on, I'm on board with that. So these quotes on the front of the bulletin talk about knowing God. And if we try to define in our own minds, come up with in our own imaginations, the perfect God, what would that look like? I just, you know... How do you get to know Jesus? How do you get to know God? 
how do you understand the relationship that Jesus has with God the Father? How, what's this relationship like? You'd think that that would be an easy thing to answer, but most Christians, I would guess, cannot answer it. And most Christians don't realize that in the early church, from the second century to at least the fifth century, the church struggled for 400 years, three, 400 years, trying to just answer these basic questions. What is, who is this Jesus? What is, what's Jesus' nature as son of God and son of man? What, what is the relationship between God the Father and God the Son? How do we make sense of what the scriptures are telling us? And what the early church, the early church was doing is what we do today to some degree. And that is kind of wrestle with what the scriptures are telling us about who God is. Especially who God is in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit. I think the important thing that stands out to me that is forgotten the most is, is this. That the scriptures give give God to us in relational terms more than attributes. Knowing is not knowing about. Knowing is knowing, getting to know, and in all relationships that, that, are, that are worth having, it's getting to know someone. Even if you've been married for 50 years, you're still getting to know someone. You can't exhaust that because it is impossible for you to know everything about one another and it's impossible for you to know everything about God. Paul said in frustration, you know, he wrote, I want to know Christ, but now I only see him like looking in a mirror that is distorted and cloudy. You know, they didn't make great mirrors back in the Roman period for an average person. They were terrible. It's some sort of polished metal usually. You know, you look, you expect to see your reflection and what you get is a reverse of your face and it's warped and it's cloudy. And Paul says, I can only see, I can only see him now like that. It's just not quite clear, but one day I'll see him face to face and it will be clear, but that's what I want more than anything. I think that's instructive. All relationships are fundamentally at their core about getting to know somebody. And so I'm not one of those preachers that will stand up here and say, you ought to know Jesus better. You ought to study more. You ought to read the Bible. I'm not about imperatives. But I do ask this question. Do you really want to know? Because if you don't want to know, nobody's forcing you. But if you do want to know, sometimes that means taking your prized images of God and for the sake of faith and growth and openness to new ways of seeing, just to put it down gently, it's not going anywhere. Nobody's going to stomp on it. Put it down gently, put it aside for a minute and just sort of erase the blackboard and look. Now, uh, he's probably not going to like me talking about him. I don't know. But Eric Huffman, who's one of the best pastors in all of Methodism over in Houston, Texas, um, he's gone with me to Israel. We planned a couple of trips over there. And, and one of the things that, that changed fundamentally, fundamentally radically for him over there was he had to undo some things that he had learned in school. And there is a school of thought. I know you don't want to know this, but you need to know this because this is happening and it's not true. And I need for you to know this, that he's not the only one that went to university or seminary and was taught by uh, professors who are of um, what I would call the evolutionary model of Christology. Now, that's a lot of big words, but what it means is that there is a theory, I think it comes from the late 19th century, maybe early 20th, but there's a theory that Christology began as low in the earliest church and then evolved higher and higher and higher. By low, I mean Jesus being 100% human and not so much divine maybe divinely inspired, but certainly not God in the flesh. And then over time, as the Christians 
thinking about Jesus evolved by the time we get to John's Gospel or the book of Revelation in the 90s AD. You know, you go from Jesus' crucifixion in the early 30s up to 95, 96, 97 AD. And what's evolved is, is a view of Jesus that's fully divine. God in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's a problem with that, and I don't, I don't know why the professors don't say this or don't acknowledge this. I hope they do. I always hope they do, but Eric didn't get that. The problem with this is that the Gospels weren't written for... First of all, you can't see that, that in the Gospels very much. From Mark to John, Mark probably being the earliest around 70 AD, you, you don't see that evolution as dramatically as these theorists paint it. But also, what was written first? What is the first Christian documents that we have? What are the first Christian documents that we have in our Bible? They're Paul's letters, not the Gospels. All of the Gospels were written after all of Paul's letters were written. So, what are the earlier letters of Paul we're talking about in the 50s AD? Okay, this, this is not long. This is around 20 years, maybe, after Jesus died. And Paul has already started his ministry and doesn't start writing his letters until he's already established a lot of churches. And in one of his earliest letters to one of his earliest churches, it's on the back of your bulletin. He seems to have quoted a Christian poem. Now, re remember, he's writing in the 50s AD. He's writing to the Philippian church in probably the 50s. It could be as late as 60 or 61, but probably in the 50s. Okay? He's in jail. And uh, he's probably in jail in Ephesus, in my opinion. And he wrote to the Philippian church after one of them came and gave him some money or some sort of a gift. He wanted to thank them and he wanted to write to them. And, or it might be a collection of several letters that he wrote to them. We're not sure. But in Philippians, he writes this thing that kind of looks like a hymn. It kind of looks like verses. It kind of looks like a Christian psalm. It has a bit of meter and rhyme. It's not... His vocabulary, it sings, it's, it, has, uh, it has a pace, it has a feel about it. And the scholars all agree that Paul has either written a Christian hymn here, or he's quoting a Christian psalm of some kind here. And, and most believe that he's quoting something that the church would have known. A lot of the writers did that. They included worship material. The book of Revelation is full of benedictions and doxologies and prayers. They included worship material. Paul was Paul did the same thing, and I'm looking at this thing, and 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 I'm so this could have been written as early as the third late 30s A.D. and sung by the earliest Christians. This is not low Christology. The first sign, the first line says, "Though he was in the form of God." This may be the oldest sentence in the New Testament. Um, arguably, 1 Thessalonians may be older. We don't, we don't know. The or it's, it's really hard to get the dates on Paul's letters, but we know they're mostly written in the mid-50s. I think Philippians was written fairly early in Paul's uh, career. And the first sentence here of this hymn that he's quoting of material written by earlier Christians than that sometime in the 30s or the 40s. Okay? This is a, this is a psalm they knew in the earliest church, in the earliest recorded words that we have, if this is indeed something he's quoting from the early church. It could be from the 30s or 40s. The first sentence is, though Jesus was in the form of God, you can't get a higher Christology than that. And when Eric saw that, and when I saw that, and when others see that, what, what it does is it kind of strikes down at this academic arrogance that has to come up with theories to explain why the early church erred and began to think of Jesus as divine. Well, it didn't come through evolution and error. It was the very first message from the very first Christians who knew him face to face their Christology was high from the get-go. This is the Big Bang. There was no, this is no gradual development. Big Bang. This is, oh man, it's like, it's like that country hymn. It's like, um, slap my grandma. That is, that's shattered the world 
turn everything upside down, shake the foundations till its core, till nothing else is standing statement. If you were inventing a God, imagining a God, the last thing I think anybody would think of is that the God of the universe would give up being God and let it go. Because when we think about God, we have to think about omnipotence and omnipresence and omniscience, all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present. But this hymn, this psalm, says that God did not value that and gave it up to be human. That's, that's super way crazy, okay? Listen to what he wrote. And the, and the word form is morphe. It means form, nature, or shape. Though Jesus was in the form of God, okay? This human being called Jesus. This fellow, born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. This guy who traveled around on the road with men and women doing an itinerant ministry of healing and preaching and teaching, etc. Okay? Used to be in the form of God. Meaning spirit. Meaning pre-existent of all time. And he did not regard, regard equality with God. By equality, that's, that's the word. Um, Esos, equality, sameness, same consistency. He did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. And, oh gosh, this is translated so badly. Um, I put in parenthesis a better translation of the Greek, in my opinion. Um, the King James Version completely butchered it because they didn't, they didn't define things the same way back then. They called it robbery. He didn't consider it robbery. Equality with, equality with God as, as robbery. But we don't mean the same thing by robbery that they did back then. What, what this word exploited means is harpagmos, and it means... Um, uh, to see something, to grasp something, uh, something prized to hold on to, something to keep, something to retain, something to use or exploit. So this, this guy, Jesus, this man from Nazareth, this Hebrew born 2,000 years ago, was in the form of God from all eternity. He didn't regard equality with God as something to be prized as to keep, but emptied. The word is kanoa or kenosis, depending on you know, its verb tense. To empty, to give up, to, to lay aside. Taking the form of a slave, a slave, dolos, slave, not servant, slave. Born in human likeness and being found in human form, he not only emptied himself of this godness, this god equality, this god form, and became a flesh and blood person, but he humbled himself, tapano'o, humbled, lowered, abased, abased himself, and became obedient. Obe okay, we sing trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. But what the hymn doesn't tell you is, is that, that the reason that we're happy in Jesus, trusting and obeying, is because God submitted to obedience in Christ Jesus to suffer death. He trusted. He obeyed. He submitted. He humbled. He abased. Ah. Even death on a cross, he was obedient to. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend every, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Fred Craddock says of this verse, these verses, this hymn, this non evolutionary big bang <clears throat> you know there was no 
incremental becoming a higher Christology. It was high Christology from the very first believers. Craddock said, Jesus was equal with God, but did not consider equality with God to be used for his own advantage, but gave up the position and did not grasp for it again. I tried to write something similarly eloquent, although I don't know that I did. Jesus Christ did not regard equality with God as a prize to cling to. Laying aside equality with God, letting go of being in the form of God, he became human, he became an obedient slave, and he submitted to death on a cross. The church birthed the highest possible Christology from day one. There was no evolution. This is in the, in the minds of uh, academics, and I heard it, and Eric heard it, and you may have heard it too. But the problem is, the followers of Jesus who knew him face to face had a different notion. And this hymn that Paul quotes proves it. So, Let's get this straight. Jesus, according to Romans 8.3, Paul wrote, God God, in Jesus, God condemned sin in the flesh. You know, I read these things and they just go past me. But if I can put aside for a minute my preconceptions and my confusion about it and just look at what it says when he wrote, God condemns sin in the flesh. What that's saying is that sin, all of our sins, were condemned in God's flesh. That's crazy. Because no, what God would do that? Give up all of that. How valuable is it to be utterly powerful, present everywhere to all times and all places, and not be stuck with a body that hurts and dies, to give that up and come down to deal with human sin and condemn it in one's own flesh. What kind of God does this? Whose idea was, could have this been? Who comes up with this? It would have never in a zillion trillion years occurred to me, and I don't think it did occur to anybody else that I know of, who could come up with this? It's absurd. Paul called it offensive to religious people. He called it moronic to intellectual people. He said, but it's the wisdom of God and, and it's how, how we were saved from ourselves. Somebody came and took care of it in the flesh. How can this be? In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, Christ is the image of God. In 1 Corinthians, he wrote, There is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist. All are from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And then in the very next sentence, he says, There is one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all are all things and through whom we exist. He used the exact same words to describe God the Father and God the Son. They're equal. In Colossians he wrote, He is the image of the invisible God. All things have been created in and through and for him he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. In Romans 9 he wrote, Christ is God over all, blessed forever, amen. We are bearers, you and me. I'm, I'm talking about you and me. We are bearers of a religiously, culturally, and intellectually inconceivable proclamation that a human being was God's very being incarnate. This is not a footnote in Christianity, but we, talk, we don't talk about it. Why don't we talk about it? This is the cent central truth of Christianity. Is the fact that we don't talk about it because we don't understand it or people will make fun of us or it sounds weird? 
It's like we skipped over it and turned Christianity into just a decisional thing. You know, it's not a relationship where you get to know something immeasurably mysterious and, and inconceivably, unbelievably upside down. No, we've made it easy. It's just steps, you know. Well, first you have to realize and admit that you're a sinner going to hell because that's what God does with people first and foremost is torture them. And then it, maybe you can, you're good enough, you can stop that from happening, and, but so I have to make a decision. So God didn't do anything. God didn't do anything. Jesus didn't do anything. But here I am, destined for torture for, for eternity. i got to do something. So I decide, and until I made that decision, it wasn't true about me. Nothing could be further from the truth what the scriptures are saying. It's, it's crazy different from that. What they're saying is something did happen to you. And you didn't have the power to decide. Th this is... Why are we talking about this? The Council of Nicaea came together in 325 to deal with these issues. It was the only thing they cared about. It was the only thing they were worried about. What is the nature of Christ? What is the nature of the relationship between Jesus and the Father? And they hammered and they fought and they hammered and they fought. It was centuries of battle. And oh, just, you, you don't want to read it. It's long, it's crazy, and it's dry. But I want you to listen to the Nicene Creed. Maybe you'll hear it anew for the first time. I don't know. In the Nicene Creed, it states that Jesus is, quote, eternally begotten of the Father. Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. That's what they hammered out. And it was one unbelievable fight in battle. And even though they made a decision to go with this, it was still back and forth and back and forth. It wasn't like it solved the problem just because they said so, because it wasn't just, it wasn't just the, 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 the leaders, the priests, the, the, the Christian leaders weren't the only ones who were battling this out when they traveled to a city to argue about it. According to the earliest records, regular Christians like you and me were marching in the street with banners fighting over the nature of Christ. Was he God or not? Some were like, well, he, he had to be a little less than God because there can only be one God, right? And the others say, yeah, but if he wasn't God, how could he redeem all of humanity? And if he wasn't a human, how could he achieve this? If he's just kind of human or appears to be human, doesn't he have to be fully God and fully human being in order to affect anything between the relationship? They fought. They fought. What begotten means, it's simple, okay? Think of birds. Of course, I would think of birds, right? Think of birds. Okay, birds make nests, but birds beget birds. Okay? Human beings can make stuff, but human beings beget human beings. Therefore, what this is saying is, is that it's not that God created the Lord Jesus Christ. God begot. This is God begetting God in the same way that a human begets a human. This is an offspring. This is connection with beyond offspring, beyond, beyond union, beyond twins, beyond identical. This is utter union and substance one. Homeousis, I think is what they called it. Uh, the same substance, the same nature, the same being of, of God was Jesus and the Father. They were of one being. Which makes things difficult for us, I realize. You know, because resurrection is more complicated, right, than the immortality of the soul. Resurrection is real hard to defend and real hard to explain and real different. 
immortality of the soul anybody a kindergartner can explain. Your soul leaves your body and goes to heaven. Resurrection is a little more complicated. Well, this, this, this in the same way is a little bit more complicated. It's more complicated to say that they're one. But if you don't, what the scriptures say he accomplished can't have happened. In our Apostles' Creed, we say he was crucified, dead, and was buried. And on the third day, he arose from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. So are we to see, are we to see ourselves and our loved ones and even our enemies and everybody on earth as having not been touched by any of that? But it only goes into effect as an offer. And then what really happens is we save ourselves by deciding. Or did something happen to the cosmos when that happened? Think about it. What, what is more cosmically cataclysmic than the God of the universe emptying Godness? Releasing that God form. To become a human being that something's happened to us if you say it's decisional a decision that makes you saved nothing happened when Jesus died nothing happened when Jesus was incarnated none of that mattered what matters is your decision the truth of the scripture is is that your decision your opinion wasn't asked the decision was made for you the question is how you respond how you understand it and the understanding of it is not about getting your, doctor, your, your, your doctrine in a row and your, and your dogma in a row and your belief system in a row and having all the descriptions of the attributes of God in a row. It has, it's described in the scriptures as a knowing. And the knowing is described in relational terms. This, isn't, this is not about knowing about God. It's about knowing God. And if... What they're saying is true from the earliest, earliest church that he was in the form of a God, in the form of God and regarded equality with God as something not to be prized and to keep, but emptied himself of it and humbled himself and abased himself and became obedient. The God of the universe says, I'll be obedient. The God of the universe says, I am your slave. The God of what? Something happened to you. Something happened to the whole human race. Something happened to the cosmos when the God who created it becomes a creature. And that, and that plan A, not plan B, plan A from the beginning of all of time was this incarn incarnation. I, I'm telling you, if the scriptures are true, something happened to us. Baxter Kruger wrote, a sort of creed and I like it and he wrote to speak the name of Jesus Christ with the Apostles and with the early church leaders is to say father the father's eternal son and it is to say Holy Spirit anointed one and it is to say the creator and sustainer of all things incarnate crucified resurrected and ascended to the father and therefore to speak the name of Jesus is to say that the triune God all of the human race and all of creation are not separated, but are together in relationship physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, in relationship. And Jesus is himself that relationship. He is the union between the triune God and the human race in him, heaven and earth. The life of the blessed Trinity and our broken human lives are united and healed. Jesus is our new creation, our adoption, our inclusion in the divine life, a new covenant relationship between God and humanity, the kingdom of the triune God on earth here and now. We are in Christ and Christ is in us as is everything. He is all in all. All things exist in and by and for and through him and he exists in all things and fills all things. This is is this not the greatest news ever? And nobody talks about it. Everybody sees Christianity as, yeah, well, you've got to get your heaven card punched so you don't get tortured. Well, that's easy to explain, isn't it? That's simple. Just be a good person and get your card punched and then you won't be tortured forever. 
Something cosmological is being described by the scriptures, though. And the early church know, know it. And now you know it if you didn't know it before. Did you think of a God when you were trying to come up with the perfect God? Did you think of a God that would not prize the perfection of omniscience and omnipresence and omnipotence, but, but would give it up, that would give up God for him, that would give up that kind of eternity? Not temporarily, not temporarily, permanently give it up. Did you think of a God who would empty himself like that? Did you think of a God that would decide to become human forever? Still human. Still human. Now and forever human. What God would do that? Did you think of a God who decided to be a slave to you and me? Decided it. Decided it. Determined it. Wouldn't have it any other way. I came to serve. Did you think of a God who would obey the call of service to the point of being obedient unto death? Even a death like he had on a cross? Did, is that what you would have come up with? A God who will rather than punishing humanity forever for killing him. By the way, God knows what murder feels like. Because we murdered him. If you want to get right down into the dirty, ugly human heart and realize that Jesus entered it and embraced it and forgave it and brought it home, you got to deal with murder. We murdered him. And that murder it was at the core of God's plan A to forgive. Who, who comes up with this? Paul said he, he Paul said he rose not for himself. Paul said he rose from the dead bodily, so that he wouldn't. You would think that a God who even would do that, who would, who would give up all of that to be human, would at least go back to being that. Go back to the form of God, to leave that body and that flesh and that pain and that memory behind and just be a free spirit again. But He didn't. He made the decision to be permanently human so that He could be permanently human with us together forever by raising us. Now, I, I don't... I, I, I couldn't have come up with that. No human, in my opinion, no human given an eternity to ponder it could ever conceive of such a God. You know, I can't believe it. Even standing here, up here before you right now, I, I, I can't fathom it. I don't understand. I want to know him though. And nobody could have come up with anything that crazy but God. I just believe that. Eternal life is knowing this God. Paul said, I decided to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. I pray that the God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. So, the emphasis is not about God's attributes. If you want to know God, it's not. Knowing is not about listing attributes. A relationship with God is not knowing about God, but knowing God. And my opinion is this. This triune God may not be the God you imagined, but it might be a God worth knowing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is My Faith Looks Up to Thee on page 452 of the Red United Methodist Hymnal. We thank everybody who's watching right now live.
We thank everybody who's watching the recording. Glad you were with us today. Let's all stand together and sing 452. May the love of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May you be sustained and comforted and empowered by his Holy Spirit. And may the love and generosity, kindness, long-suffering, graciousness of his Heavenly Father rest upon your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. See you all on Wednesday night at 6.30 Eastern. We'll be talking about Gehenna. search. We're looking at all the words that are translated as hell. Hope you can be there with us each Wednesday night at 6.30 on live stream or Zoom on the Al Rock group. Thank you.